Nehemiah chapter 13. And I shall begin by reading the entire chapter. Nehemiah 13. On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people. And there it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God. Because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam to call a curse down on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. When the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. Before this, Eliashib the priest had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah, and he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles and also the tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians and gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priests. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil into the storerooms. I put Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and a Levite named Padiah in charge of the storerooms and made Hanan, son of Zakur, the son of Mataniah, their assistant, because they were considered trustworthy. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their fellow, fellow Levites. Remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. In those days, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore, I warned them against selling food on that day. People from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this wicked thing you are doing, desecrating the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same things so that our God brought all this calamity on us and on this city? Now you are stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. When evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. Once or twice, the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem. But I warned them and said, why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this again, I will arrest you. From that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. 
Remember me for this also, my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. Moreover, in those days, I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of the other peoples and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. I made them take an oath in God's name and said, you are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. Was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many nations, there was no king like him. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign women. Must we hear now that you too are doing all this terrible wickedness and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women? One of the sons of Joida, son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat the Horonite, and I drove him away from me. Remember them, my God, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. So I purified the priests and the Levites of everything foreign and assigned them duties each to his own task, I also made provision for contributions of wood at designated times and for the first fruits. Remember me with favor, my God. This is the word of the Lord. I suppose if I had to give a title to all of Nehemiah, I wouldn't call it Hand Me Another Brick or How to Build a Wall. It would be something like the triumph and failure of Reformation and Revival. If I were writing the book of Nehemiah, what a cheeky way to put things, but if I were writing the book of Nehemiah in order to turn it into a blockbuster seller, I would have ended at chapter 12, verse 43. You can picture it, glorious sunset on the screen with the credits going up and spectacular, exhilarating music in the background, and you go away feeling really good. Uh, a couple of hours of escapism in a wonderful film, and now instead, God giving us this book intends it to end on this downer note. What has gone wrong? I want to run through the chapter with you, first of all, quickly to see what the details are about this declension and then reflect with you a little bit on what this is saying about the book of Nehemiah as a whole and then what this says for us today when we long for reformation and revival and how this brings us back yet again to King Jesus. You have to remember now that Nehemiah, after spending 12 years as governor, and we don't know how long it took before you have this spectacular scene of the choirs marching around the wall with antiphonal singing and a, a great hallelujah chorus from those who are in the Midlands. We don't know how long it took. We know how long it took to build a wall. It, it, it might have been two, three, four, five years before he got everything ordered after that. But altogether, he spent 12 years. We're told in verse 6 that in the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, he had to go back to Susa. He came in the 20th year, so he spent 12 years then in this spectacular project. But then he goes back and picks up his duties in the imperial court. Sometime later, we're not told how long, sometime later he seeks permission from the king and returns to Jerusalem transparently as governor. And what he finds, he finds listed in this chapter. 
Number one, new legalism, verses one to three. The book of Moses was read aloud, and there it was found, we're told, that no Ammonite or Moabite should be admitted into the assembly of God because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam to call a curse down on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. When the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. Now, when people quote the Bible at you, it's good to look up the original text. It's good to see what the Word of God actually says. In this case, the passage being referred to is transparently Deuteronomy 23, verses 3 to 5. No Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even in the tenth generation. For they did not come to meet you with bread and water on your way when you came out of Egypt. And they hired Balaam, son of Beor, from Pethor and Aram, Naharim, to pronounce a curse on you. However, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but turned the curse into a blessing for you, because the Lord your God loves you. Now you have to remember that what God pronounced with respect to the Moabites and the Ammonites arose because of the particular perniciousness with which they sought to corrupt Israel. Initially, Israel had approached them and said, we need to pass through your territory. We'll pay for any water we drink and any food we eat, we'll pay but they wouldn't let them through. They wouldn't let them rite of passage. So eventually there was some struggle and war, but much worse. They gave advice to Balaam, a prophet of dubious character. They, 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 they sought his advice, first of all, to bring a curse down, some sort of magical curse down on, 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 on the people, thinking that Balaam, because he is some sort of prophet of Yahweh, could, could actually do some magic spells or pronounce some incantations that would, that would bring down the wrath of Yahweh on Israel and thus their enemies would be destroyed. Balaam manages to avoid all of this despite the large sums of money that were being offered to him. But he found another way in which he could get into the good graces of the Ammonites and the Moabites get some of their money. What he suggests is that they show themselves friendly. They, they start interacting on a peaceable platform so that pretty soon the inevitable happens. Their young men, their young women interact with the young men and young women of Israel and pretty soon there's intermarriage. The issue here is not mixed race marriages as we think of them. The issue here, to use our way of looking at it, is whether believers should be marrying unbelievers. To have a mixed race marriage then meant that Israel, which was the locus of the covenant people of God, would soon be intermingled with the pagan religions all around. And then what happened in the days of Solomon some years later would take place. Solomon established pagan temples in Jerusalem to satisfy his brides. Long before Solomon was there, Balaam was saying, hey, if you want God to be angry with the Israelites, just get them to sin. Don't go out there and say, come on, Israel, sin, sin. But go out there and say, isn't my daughter beautiful? My, my son really loves your daughter. And, and pretty soon, in half a generation or so, you, you, you've achieved the same result. You have people so compromised in their commitment to the living God that <clears throat> they will attract the wrath of God down on their own heads. God is so angry by the seductive wickedness of this sin that he pronounces this curse on Ammon and Moab. Nevertheless, what the people of Judah in Nehemiah 13 infer from this curse goes way beyond anything Scripture says. The same thing is not said with respect to all non-Israelites. 
They're not to intermingle, that's true, but there are ways in which they can become Israelites. They can put themselves under the covenant. They can accept circumcision. They can become, in effect, Israelites. Only of Ammon and Moab is it prohibited that, that they be allowed to become Israelites down to the 10th generation. So this is actually going beyond what is said. We see that we're supposed to keep ourselves separate, so we'll really separate. We'll, we'll expel anybody who claims to be an Israelite today who does not have Abraham's blood coursing through his veins. What does this forget? It forgets that God, despite the prohibition, actually sets his affection in grace and love on some particular Moabites, like Ruth, the great-grandmother of David, R Ruth, the Moabitess, who is allowed into the line and is indeed in the Messianic line. So what this step is doing is something that recurs often in reformations and revival. Once the thing takes hold, people try to become more holy than God. When I was an undergraduate at McGill many moons ago studying chemistry, the Christian fellowship group at the time in the mid-60s was interacting inevitably with a lot of Marxists. Thousands of students went around the campus carrying Mao's little red book. I carefully read it myself from cover to cover. I'm sure there were times when it was in my stack of books too. But there were a lot of little red books on the campus. One of the Christian leaders suggested that we Christians ought to start carrying our Bibles. If the Marxists were pleased to sport Mao's little red book, shouldn't we be grateful to God for the book that God has given us? So start carrying Bibles. And so in due course, the Christians of McGill Christian Fellowship started carrying Bibles. And then I noticed three weeks later that some of my fellow Christians were carrying very big black Bibles. It is so easy somehow to turn what is a good instinct, even a biblically prescribed mandate, into something that is more rule oriented and a, a, a kind of public sign test that I'm one of the good guys. You don't do that when it's unpopular to be following the Reformation. But once the Reformation takes hold, then inevitably you find some people who are trying to be more holy than God. It's another form of legalism. Instead of casting themselves on the mercy of God, they start surrounding themselves with endless rules, which they can always justify in some way by appealing to some sort of text back in the Bible, but, but, but the external thing goes just one step farther. Instead of, instead of having a Sabbath law, then you invent 39 categories of prohibited work, which is what rabbis in Jesus' day did. New legalism. Number two, the triumph of nepotism. That is, blood relations become more important than the blood of the covenant. Do you see what happens in verses four to nine? Eliashib the priest had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah. That's an idiom in the original that probably means he was tied to him by marriage in some way. And because of this family connection now, using his power as the one in charge of the storerooms in the temple, he cleared out a suite of rooms to make a nice apartment for Tobiah. Tobiah, the one who had laughed when the wall was being built. Uh, stupid little wall, if a fox jumps up on it, it'll crumble. Archaeology has exposed that wall. At the top, it's about nine feet across. Some fox. 
strong enough wall to take two choirs going around the outside, singing back and forth antiphonally, complete with an orchestral arrangement. But now Tobiah, having lost, has not, so far as we can tell, in any sense, repented. He just wants to be on the winning side where the money is, where the power is. Jerusalem was a pile of ruins. Now it's beginning to become a prosperous place. And he, he'd like a business apartment downtown, right at the center. The, the temple would do fine, don't you think? And so Eliashib cleans out some of the rooms, rooms that are supposed to be storing the utensils and product that are necessary for the right operation of the temple. So this is simultaneously despising the temple of God and colluding with the enemy as if the holiness of God doesn't matter. Nepotism is more important than the covenant. Blood relations are more important than the blood of the covenant. I could tell you the story of a particular seminary where the president of the seminary worried about the theological drift in his own son. He knew that his son no longer held to inerrancy. But he persuaded the faculty members of that seminary to take on this son as a faculty member in the hope, no doubt, in the father's mind that somehow the strength of the other faculty members would rein him in a bit and curb him a bit. In fact, it became one of the first steps toward that seminary's drift in another direction. Now, he wouldn't have done that for my son. He did it for his son. Nepotism. Small wonder Jesus insists that we are to love God more than our own parents. In fact, he can put it in the strongest sort of rhetoric, an opposition that is initially shocking to us. The one who loves Jesus must hate his father and mother. Well, of, of course, it's, it's a way of speaking in, in absolute terms to get a point across. The, the same scripture teaches us that we're to honor our parents. So it does not justify familial hatred. And yet, and yet, when it comes comparison to, between allegiance to Jesus and allegiance to, to bloodlines, allegiance to Jesus must win. And here, nepotism has triumphed over faithfulness to God. Number three, the neglect of covenantal faithfulness, especially with respect to the temple. Verses 10 to 13. Now, there have been some parts of Nehemiah that we haven't spent a lot of time on. We've jumped over them, but they're surfacing again here. In the renewal of the covenant in chapter 10... What is very striking as you read those verses through is that most of the renewal of the covenant is bound up with a temple. You and I might think, why didn't they renew the covenant and put in a whole lot about um, not submitting to idolatry and telling the truth and loving God with heart and soul and mind and strength and not committing adultery and not succumbing to hate. None of that's mentioned. There's a generalized account about how they're supposed to obey now all of the law of Moses. But then almost all of the rest of the covenantal renewal is bound up with providing allegiance to those ceremonial aspects of the law that allow the flourishing of the temple. And you start saying, was Nehemiah sort of a pre-Jesus Pharisee? Interested in all of the externals of religion? Is, is that the way you're supposed to understand him? No, 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 no. The temple was central precisely because the relationship between us and God, between human beings and God, is more important than the relationship amongst ourselves. Now, you, you can't put a wedge between the two as if you can just follow one and not the other. But when we think of sin today, what's wrong, what's ugly, then we so often think in terms of social malformation of one sort or another. Do you ever wake up in the middle of the night 
And in that half luminescent waking, sleeping, your mind flashes back to something that you've done in the past where you've said something extraordinarily stupid or insensitive or cruel even, and you sort of writhe there in the sheets for a few moments, uh, wishing that you could go back and, and redo that bit of your life. But of course, the moving hand having writ moves on, as the poet says, and you, you can't go back, and then mercifully you go back to sleep. Tell me, am I the only one who's had experiences like that? Well, for those of you who have had them, tell me this. When you writhe there in shame for a few moments in this half-sleep, half-wake moment, before whom are you feeling shame? Isn't it virtually always before other people? I can't believe I embarrass myself by saying something so stupid. They can be from many, many different times of your life. When I was five years old, my parents threw a birthday party for me. And the other kids came in, and I am reported to have said, I, I, I don't remember, but it was drilled into me so long after that it's become a memory. <laughs> I, I am reported to have said, where are the presents? which is not normally the way you're supposed to invite people to your party, do you, do you know? And I can remember the look on my mother's face. <gasps> Donnie. So, well, I, I wake up at night and remember that. I mean, it's, it, I, I told you that one because it's one of the least embarrassing. I'd hate to tell you the most embarrassing. <laughs> and, 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 and I embarrass myself in front of my friends, and I embarrass myself in front of my parents, I embarrass myself in front of my sister and my brother and so on. You know, I, didn't, I don't wake up at night thinking I embarrass myself before God. But the heart of sin is still that it is an offense before God. How come we don't wake up and writhe in embarrassment over our sins before God? But Nehemiah gets it. Yes, yes, there must be a renewal of the covenant to the whole law. After all, they live under that covenant. They are to obey the whole law. And that includes laws about honoring your parents and not coveting and not hating and not committing adultery and telling the truth and loving your neighbor and all of that. That's true. But he understands that what we must have above all else, what we must have is a right relationship with God. And under the terms of the old covenant, that was secured by the sacrifices that God himself had ordained. Oh, I know they point forward to the ultimate temple, to the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate Passover lamb. I, I, I know that. But at that point in redemptive history, the access we have in Nehemiah's day to forgiveness, to reconciliation with him is precisely through the temple structures that God himself ordained. That's why there's so much emphasis on the temple right through this book. It's why after the beautiful scene with the credits running up the screen, you have the institutionalization of order to make sure that the temple is preserved. And now what do you have here in declension? What you have here now in declension is the neglect of covenantal faithfulness, especially with respect to the temple. In each case, Nehemiah takes strong answer, strong action to clean up the problem. He's right. But what does the failure itself say about how deeply this reformation and revival have taken hold? And then in verses 15 to 22, there is the triumph of profit over piety. If you can make a little extra money on the Sabbath, then why observe the Sabbath? And again, the action that Nehemiah takes is pretty rigorous. He's right, but what does it say about the Reformation? Then number five, the mixed marriages described in 23 to 28. We're back at that again. Ezra faced that a decade and a half earlier. Solomon faced it six centuries earlier, five centuries earlier. 
It, it recurs again and again and again. Three or four centuries before that, then under the advice of Balaam, the Israelites had faced it with respect to Ammon and Moab. It's, it's coming back again. But I love him. Besides, I know, I know a Christian woman who married an, an, a non-Christian guy and he, he was converted, you know. After three years, he was converted. It worked out very well, you know. When Nehemiah 13 comments that some of their kids couldn't even speak Aramaic, they could only speak Ammonite, it's not that this is a kind of hatred of strangers, a, a kind of narrow tribalism that is at issue. The point is they don't know the language of the people of God, so they don't know the covenants of the people of God. They don't know the worship of the people of God. They, they, they don't know the God of the people of God. Now it's all becoming one mishmash. That Israelite religion is a bit narrow, you know. I, I'm quite a spiritual person. And this kind of declension had reached all the way up to the high priest's family. Verse 28, one of the sons of Joiada, son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat the Horonite, and I drove him away from me. Then there's one more. I'm not entirely sure of it. Have you noticed that at two or three points in the book, Nehemiah has said something like, remember me, O God, for what I have done. The first one shows up in chapter 5, 519. Remember me with favor, my God, for all I have done for these people. And of course, it keeps showing up in this chapter, verse 14. Remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. Verse 22b. Remember me for this also, my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. Verse 29, remember them, my God. There have been one or two of those, too. Remember them, my God, because they defile the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. And then how does the book end up? Remember me with favor, my God. Now, if you took any one of those, it would be easy to make sense of it as the faithful utterance of a godly man looking into the face of his heavenly father. It's a kind of Old Testament analog to what the apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. It's a kind of equivalent to that, isn't it? But I have to tell you that when they show up in this degree of concentration in the last chapter, where the entire chapter is about spiritual declension, I think there's another overtone here. This does not sound exactly like the Nehemiah of chapter 1. The Nehemiah of chapter 1 who says things like this. I confess my sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We, we, we have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. There's another remember. Remember but it's a remember that calls God back to remember his covenantal mercy even when the people are sinning. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants. Verse 11, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Why doesn't this book end up with Remember, O oh Lord, so to work within us by your power, according to your covenantal mercies, that we will again revere your name. Why do we get this repeated refrain in this chapter? 
Remember me, Lord, I've done quite a lot of work. I've done a pretty good job. I mean, they failed. Remember them too. <laughs> but remember me. In other words, this feels like a kind of spiritual declension. That might be too harsh. God's got to sort that one out. But I do ask myself why God, in his perfect wisdom, has recorded four of these utterances in one short chapter, the last chapter, with a very different tone and emphasis, a different context from what you find in the first chapter on Nehemiah's lips. And that's how the Reformation ends. It's how the book ends. There are some people who are used by God to bring along the church of the living God in some wonderfully powerful ways for a period of time and then end up late in life in danger of destroying what they built. It's for a lot of different reasons. Some men get cranky. They discover at 75 they can't do what they did at 45 and they resent the young men coming along. They clamored and worked hard and suffered and did it cheerfully as unto God and now they want to, to sit on their laurels just a wee bit, rest on them and and receive the plaudits of, of, of their years and years of stewardship. And wittingly or otherwise, they begin to destroy what they built. A number of years ago at Trinity, we invited Carl F.H. Henry and Kenneth Conser to give lectures when they were in their 80s about their perception of evangelicalism and its state in the United States over the previous virtually a century. These men had been involved closely with most of the major movements during that time. And now that they were in their senior years, we, we invited them to lecture to our entire student body, at that time six or seven hundred, who, who, who would hear these venerable saints discuss what God had done in their experience and so on. The, the lectures were really quite interesting. You can still see them on video. The next day, then, I was charged with interviewing them, and I didn't tell them the questions in advance, just like some people you know. <laughs> and most of the questions were fairly innocent, and I wanted to know their opinion about this development and that development. And they always answered with sagacity and nuance and, and maturity. They, they, they had answered questions before. And then finally, I asked this question. I said, some men, when they get old, become defensive and crotchety and mean-spirited. They're always looking backward and they're resentful of the young. But you two guys, as you've got older, you've become more generous. You're constantly looking to the future. You, 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 you are an encouragement constantly to young men and women coming along behind. And, and you're praying toward the future and thanking God for the past. And I just don't find a bitter, a bitter bone in your body. I don't, I don't find malice. I, I don't find grumpiness. How did that happen? Don't tell me it's the grace of God. I know it's the grace of God. I want to know how the grace of God worked out in your life so that this is how you came out at the end, do you know? And they both sort of <laughs> sputtered, you know, two very articulate men not knowing what to say and looking around the place and wishing I had given them the questions in advance. <laughs> and finally, Carl Henry blurbed out the best moment on those hours of videotaping. He, he blurbed out, how can anybody be arrogant when he stands beside the cross? Now, of course, he utters that in the light of the fuller revelation of a new covenant. But what I miss here at the end of Nehemiah is some sort of utterance like this. 
How can anyone be arrogant or self-justifying when he looks back over the last 20 years and see what God has done to transform this city and anticipate the coming of the promised Redeemer? I don't hear that. What I hear instead is, remember me, O oh God, I've done a pretty good job. I've worked pretty hard. And we remember what Jesus says about how all of us at our best are not more than unprofitable servants. So now what shall we make of this chapter? What do we learn from it? It's a nice depressing way to end a conference, isn't it? <laughs> Some people say that the lesson of Nehemiah is basically this. There's sin at the beginning, there's sin in the middle, and there's sin at the end. All you get, because it's the old covenant, is sin at the beginning, sin in the middle, and sin at the end. What that means is you just have to wait for Jesus. And there is some truth to that, but more needs to be said. You, you see, that is part of the emphasis of this book, and that's, that, that, that's why the exposition of John Piper was so telling. Again and again and again, these cycles of sin that take the people down, and then within his six polarities of judgment, followed by a cry to God for mercy, and God coming back with mercy, even within those, you, you can focus more narrowly and drill down and find the pattern in a micro way. For example, you come to the blessings and curses of the book of Deuteronomy, but how does Deuteronomy end? Moses himself doesn't even get into the promised land. Then finally they do get in, and you have the cycles of the book of Judges. And, a generation or two and the, the people are succumbing to idolatry again and again and again. There is judgment. The Midianites are upon them. The Philistines are upon them. God raises up a hero, a judge of one sort or another. They're, they're cleared out again. But the cycles keep getting lower and lower and lower. Everyone is doing that which is right in their own eyes. Till you come to the end of the book of Judges, it's so ghastly, it's so awful that even the good guys are wretched people. You can't read chapters 19 to 21 in, in polite company. It, it's, it's horrible stuff. You cut up your concubine into parts and send her around Israel to gather the nation to fight. These are the good guys. Oh God, how we need a king. So the people get a king. That didn't turn out too well. So God raises up a man after his own heart who commits adultery and murder. One wonders what he would have done if he hadn't been a man after God's own heart. And on and on and on and on. So there is a sense in which Nehemiah is part of the Old Testament storyline that keeps saying there's sin at the beginning and sin in the middle and sin at the end. There's no answer here. And thus there is a pointing forward to the ultimate hope. Jesus himself bearing our sin once for all so there is no more sacrifice for sin. Not a mobile tabernacle or a hunk of masonry in Jerusalem, but Jesus himself as the temple of God, the meeting place between God and sinners. Moreover, Jerusalem is symbol-laden on several fronts. We've seen that again and again. Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Jerusalem is the place of the temple. Jerusalem is the place where God has chosen to plant his name. Jerusalem is the center of the covenant people of God under the terms of the old covenant. And now already at the end of chapter 12, repeated name of David? Oh, okay, we've got the wall. We, we've got the people. We've got the temple. We've got the priests. We've got the sacrificial system. This is pretty wonderful. Pointing forward to the ultimate Sacrifice, sacrifice, fine. Where's David? Mentioning him like this reminds us that for this nation to be properly constituted, there needs to be the promised Davidic king. But of course, at this juncture, politically, that wasn't possible. Any Davidic king restored to the throne would have brought down all of the Persian forces on the head of this little city-state. So they knew who it should be. The genealogical records were preserved. What happens next in history after the Old Testament books aren't being written anymore? 
Well, the Persian Empire was taken over by the Greek Empire. Alexander the Great and his bands of marauding rifts, taking the empire all the way to the borders of India. Then he dies in his 30s. He bequeaths his kingdom to four generals. One of them establishes the Seleucid dynasty just to the north of Israel, and another establishes the Ptolemaic dynasty to the south in Egypt. And that means little Israel is squashed in no man's land again. For decade after decade, it keeps changing sides, is beaten up by this side, then the other side. They certainly can't have a Davidic king. Eventually, at the beginning of the second century, one of the Seleucid kings decides he's going to destroy and crush Judaism once and for all. He moves in his troops, sacrifices pigs in the temple, makes it a capital offense to observe the Sabbath, makes it a capital offense to own any part of the law, resolves to kill all priests. There's bloodshed in the land. But God raises up a guerrilla warrior called Judas the Hammer, in Aramaic, Maccabeus, and hence the Maccabean Revolt. It was guerrilla warfare. You can read about it in the writings of the first century historian Josephus. After three and a half years of bloody warfare, they built up enough strength to have a set piece on the banks of the Orontes River. They beat the Syrian army, and for the first time in half a millennium, they are free to establish a Davidic son on the throne in Jerusalem. At last, we can have Jerusalem, the city of God, in anticipation of the new Jerusalem. The temple, in anticipation of the, 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 the temple that, that truly does bring men and women before the presence of God. A, a priesthood, looking forward to an ultimate priest. A, a, a sacrifice, looking forward to the ultimate sacrifice. And the Davidic king, in line for the ultimate Davidite, the, the one who was called by Isaiah, centuries earlier, the one who was called the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So is that what they do? Look up the records? Restore a David eye to the throne? No. The guerrilla leaders themselves want the power. They install themselves. Another century goes by, you arrive at 63 BC and the Romans take over. And where is David? Where are the promises of God? Then you turn a few more pages and you read in the first line of the New Testament, the origins of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. The king has come. The priest has come. The temple has come. The sacrifice has come. So yes, there is a profound sense in which, in which Nehemiah is really saying not too much more than there was sin at the beginning and there was sin in the middle and there's sin at the end and we're looking for something more. But much was accomplished in the short term. You must not despise days of mercy. The fact of the matter is that Jerusalem was, the Jerusalem wall was rebuilt. The city was repopulated. The sacrificial system was restored. There were moments of great public confession, moving tears, the sense of the presence of God powerfully among them. It was a great time of personal, national revival. It should not be despised. Moreover, although I would not want to minimize or underestimate the power of Christ and the gospel, that gospel is not yet consummated in all that it will do. So the fact remains that even though we live this side of the cross, and even though there is no more sacrifice for sin, the ultimate sacrifice has been paid, and even though the Davidic king is installed, all authority is mine, he says, in heaven and on earth, yet, yet, Yet the consummation is not here. He is being contested in all that he says and does, and that will continue until he has put the last enemy under his feet, the last enemy being death itself. And until then, even the church of the living God is open to times of declension and reformation and revival. To see that, all you have to do is read the New Testament. Read the letters to the seven churches and. Revelation 2 and 3, five of the seven churches are in danger of having their candlestick removed 
That is, they will stop being churches unless they repent. God will snuff out their light. They, they, they will not be the people of God anymore. They will be destroyed. Indeed, the general tone of the New Testament is that we have so much more light than our Old Testament brothers and sisters in God that we are in greater danger if we ignore this revelation. Hence, for example, Hebrews chapter 2, we must pay the more careful attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. For since the message pro spoken through angels, that is to Moses and his people, was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? We know so much more. We have received so much more. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. God have mercy on us if we turn away from him. And so it pleases God in the pattern of the Old Testament saints experience to do something analogous, something even more powerful in our days. There are times of declension in the church of the living God too. And God does sometimes send reformation and revival out of sheer grace. Is there not something in you that wants to cry as you read those accounts in the New Testament and in the history of the church? Oh, Lord God, do it again. I have been on the edges of revival in two or three places. There was the so-called Canadian revival in 1970. It began with the preaching ministry of the Sutera Twins in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. What started off as some brief meetings turned into night after night when the praises of God filled the building, confession of sin took place, people were coming in off the streets not knowing quite why they were there, falling down on their faces and getting converted. The crime rate in the, rate in the city fell down as people started restoring things they had stolen earlier. Th th this was an amazing movement of God, not unknown in times of other revivals and, and, and reformations. The movement spread across the country. It was quickly destroyed. I, I remember hearing one spectacular story as, as a Christian confessed his sin and, and how the Lord had restored him to to a right relationship with God as, as he opened his eyes to see afresh the cross and the ugliness of idolatry and, and, and how his life had been cleaned up and how he was so ashamed of his sin. And tears flowed down his face. And there were a mingling of, of abject sorrow and, and holy joy. It was so moving. Unfortunately, somebody tapped him on the shoulder and said, I wonder if you'd like to fly to my city and tell that story at my church tomorrow night. And pretty soon the whole thing was domesticated and organized and diminished and it became external you can somehow have more legalism and and more disobedience in the same crowd you're you're looking for the experience after a while and no longer looking for god yeah that that happens too but on the other hand when the spirit of god does come down in power christians know they have met with the living god And there's no place for arrogance left anymore. No place for excuses. There is contrition. And somehow a strange joy. As we see our sins for what they are. And see the grace of God as the only remedy in Christ Jesus and his cross and resurrection. Christians are restored to the living God. Men and women are converted. Is there not something in you that wants to cry to God? Have mercy on us. You brought reformation and revival in Old Testament times. You have done so in the history of the church again and again. In a time of declension, both within and without the church in North America, will you not visit us, not as we deserve in judgment, 
will you not visit us in mercy? If in judgment, Lord God, we bow before it because we deserve it, you are still good. You are right. We are wicked. But look at us, Lord God. Our faces are toward you. To whom shall we go? Your son has the words of eternal life. We must not come to the end of Nehemiah and simply end on a note of fatalism. If God sends revival, God sends revival, nothing I can do about it. If he withholds revival, he withholds revival, nothing I can do about it. Rather, we must follow the pattern already set down in the old covenant scriptures, the pattern that insists we examine ourselves before the living God and confess our sins and ask for mercy. God brings the judgment. God brings the revival. So we reflect that even in the New Testament, Paul faced major heresy erupting in the first churches he planted, like Galatia. He faced the rage of Satan and saw dangers in Asia Minor, the western third of, minor, of, of modern Turkey, and knew that, knew that the church would be crushed by all kinds of terrible temptations, and he testifies in his last letter, all those in Asia have, have forsaken me. That's in the first century. And, and we look in our day, and do we not want to say, Lord God, your name is being despised in the nation. Your, God, your name is often mocked, even within the professing church. We are part of this age of wickedness. We, too, belong to the evil age of self-gratification, pornography, carelessness about your word, endless lust for pleasure and entertainment, very little knowledge of what it means to live in the joy of service under the cross. Will you not rekindle our own hearts and make us see something again of Christ's glory and beauty so we are drawn irresistibly to him and fall before him with repentance and holy joy? Will you not have mercy upon us? So we press on, constantly aware that Christ has said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uncertain whether God will visit us with more judgment as we deserve in the Western world, or whether he will visit us with great mercy and send washing over us streams of reformation and revival that we cannot possibly imagine, powerful, transforming. But even if God were to do that, understand this, that unless Jesus came back right in the middle of it, there would be further declension because we're a sinful people and until Christ comes back, the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. They are at war constantly and these struggles we will face until the end of the age when Jesus himself crushes the last enemy. So this is simultaneously a, a call to perseverance, to the long view and a call to petition God for reformation and revival such that we have not known in our time. Let us pray. The more we think about these things, Lord God, the more we are stunned by your patience with us, your forbearance, your grace toward us again and again. You do not treat us as our sins deserve. We pray that you will give us insight into your word, faith to believe, wills to perform and do, and hearts to love you with heart and soul and mind and strength. And beyond that, Lord God, we dare to ask that you do what the pundits say cannot be done. 
to reverse the tides of history, to raise Jesus up again so that he is honored and praised instead of mocked and blasphemed. We hunger to see men and women cherish holiness in love with the living God, therefore crushed by their own sin, yet ecstatically freed by the forgiveness secured by Christ's death on our behalf. We read the pages of history and know you have acted like this in times past, and we dare to pray while blessing others in other places. Do not pass us by. Have mercy upon us. And if it will please you and bring glory to your dear Son, we beg of you, open the windows of heaven and pour out upon us a blessing that there is not room to contain it. And as we look around the world, we, we dare pray for this not just for ourselves, but for brothers and sisters in the most remote, remote corners. There are some places where brothers and sisters are, are dying daily. We thank you for sustaining them in such sacrifice. But we pray once again that you will lay bare your arm and show again that Christ is king. And even in the midst of suffering, bring forth such holy joy amongst your people that others will look at them and take knowledge. They have been with Jesus. And therefore glorify your dear son's name. Will you not forgive us our sins for Jesus' sake and pour out upon us the powerful spirit bequeathed at Pentecost that we may love you truly and rejoice to obey your word and cling to the cross and live with eternity's values in view to the glory of your dear Son in whose name we pray. Amen.